Best Book Bits podcast brings you the book summary of Power Shift, Transform Any Situation, Close Any Deal, and Achieve Any Outcome by Damon John. Have you ever wanted to make a big change in your life but weren't sure where to start? In Power Shift, Damon John shares the answer. To take control of your destiny, drive the change you want to see, you need to lay the groundwork so you're prepared to seize every opportunity that comes your way. And that means mastering, influence, make an impression. Develop a reputation that highlights what you stand for. Negotiation, make a deal. Hone a win-win negotiating style. Relationships, make a connection last. Nurture those connections you make along the way. Through never before told stories from his life and career, Damon shares the lessons that got him to where he is today from how he remade his public image as he transitioned from clothing mogul to television personality, to how he mastered the negotiation strategies that determine whether deals are won or lost in the tank, to his secrets for building long-lasting and profitable relationships with founders and brands. Chapter 1. The most successful businesses offer lives rather than items. Here's a simple fact. Not every sweater is the same. On the other hand, there's the ubiquitous sweater that can be found almost any place. It's simple, inexpensive, and practical. It's the type of item you buy when you forgot to bring a sweater on vacation. It doesn't really matter who made it. And then there is the sweatshirt you purchase because you're looking for a specific model from a specific brand. It isn't just these sweaters are more expensive, though they typically are. There's a lot more to them than simply the cloth. They represent something. They correspond to your self-perception and express something about who you are. Damon is the author of this book. John originally established a reputation for himself in the fashion business by designing clothes that allowed people to do just that. But first, let's take a closer look at the many types of clothes that are available. The generic sweater represents the first kind. This is a moderate, non-branded category. Consider the simple t-shirts and jeans that can be found in most big supermarkets across the world. A second category is also available at such supermarkets. These clothings are a little more expensive and are branded, although with the house label symbol emblem. Consider the Kirkland brand at Costco, although you don't buy pants or socks because of this label. It is present nothingness, distinguishing them from their less expensive equivalents. You're buying items from the third category if you usually buy one brand of shoe because it has greater grip or cushioning. Selections in this market sector are influenced by trust. You know exactly what you're getting when you buy from a single brand. This is where Under Armour, an American sportswear company, got its start. It began by making sports t-shirts that wick away sweat better than competitor shirts, and then eventually moved into leisure wear. Under Armour was selling more than just goods at this point, wherein the label's clothing was more than simply a means to an end. It was a way of life. What is the key to making this transition? Under Armour, on the other hand, put what it preached into reality. They made the greatest sport shirts on the market, which gave it credibility. People might eventually utilize the athletic image of the brand to create a tale about who they were and what they stood for. This insight isn't only about selling clothing. As well, we'll see in the following chapters, it's also important for personal branding. Chapter 2. The most successful personal brands are readily identifiable and represent a certain value. Robert Craig Knievel was simply a regular man who enjoyed doing stunts on his motorbike, but he had a knack for spotting marketing. His daredevil antics, which included a leap over a cage of rattlesnakes, drew a lot of attention. He was quickly to given a monkier. He was that man. People began to recall his name as word spread, but it wasn't a fantastic name. So when a constable handed him a citation for a reckless driving and jokingly referred to him as evil, Knievel. He took it seriously. It was ideal for posters since it told people what to anticipate at his rodeos. This had evolved into a lifestyle brand. Knievel became linked with excitement and daredevilish because he was always clad in the same flashy red, white, and blue motocross outfits. 
parents warn their children not to be evil Knievels by jumping off roofs. In other words, his name meant something. One thing that all successful individuals have in common is that their names are linked to certain characteristics, ideals, and accomplishments. Consider a few historical instances. Muhammad Ali's floated like a butterfly and stung like a bee, while Aretha Franklin was known as the Queen of Soul. A strong personal brand communicates who you are and what others may expect from you to the rest of the world, and that can help you gain traction when trying to persuade others. So, how do you go about establishing that winning reputation? As we saw in the last chapters, you must practice what you teach. However, the first step is to define your message and verbalize it. What kind of person do you want to be? To narrow it down, come up with five or six adjectives and try them on for size. How do you conduct yourself in a way that shows compassion if you're all about it? However, simply walking the walk isn't enough. You must actively promote your brand. If your business has a charity goal, for example, you must publicize it. You'll need to discover the appropriate channels to accomplish this. Back in 2005, MySpace was a wonderful tool for this, but it's unlikely to help you spread the word in 2020. Lastly, you want to make a memorable impression. Consider the case of Evil Knievel. Of course, you won't want to jump over rattlesnakes, infested cages, but the concept is the same. Turn heads to develop your brand. Chapter 3, Winning Over the Big Names Isn't Necessary to Open Doors. The acronym FUBU translates for, for us, by us, which is the name of John's record company. It had a single aim when it was founded in the early 1990s, to place the garments worn by New York's hip-hop musicians and fans on the fashion map. It wasn't simple to get the word out back then. After all, this was before the internet. There was some news coverage to be sure. There was a new film managed by black entrepreneurs who were deeply anchored in the hip-hop hotbeds. A few interviews here and there, however, were insufficient. Influencers were another option for getting a trademark out there. Of course, this was before Instagram, but influencers played a similar role in the fashion industry back then as they do now. Instead of shooting themselves in giveaways, they wore them to the hottest nightclubs in New York. It was a tested strategy, but FUBU saw an opportunity to do things differently. The typical influencer was thin, youthful, and accustomed to being the center of attention. They were pampered with complimentary clothing and had their pick of the city's most fashionable labels. Even if you were successful in convincing them to wear your clothes, they rarely did so more than once. John observed something unusual just as he was starting to consider recruiting influencers. Customers who purchased larger sizes, such as 4X, 5X, and 6X, tended to wear them out quickly. The problem was that it was difficult to locate shirts in these sizes that were as popular as the ones FUBU was producing. Now, who were all these 300 pound, six foot tall customers? Many of them were the type of security guards that worked outside nightclubs. John figured out how to put two and two together. Although these security staffs were already a part of the city's fashion culture, producers tended to treat them like furniture. Why not express gratitude by giving them the freebies? It was a brilliant move. The security people loved the attention and FUBU's double XL sized emblem was now displayed prominently outside every upscale New York nightclub. Other doors were also opened as a result of the relocation. One of the part-time bouncers John worked with, Beast, was also the director of security for Ralph McDaniels, a well-known hip-hop producer in the city. Beast was instrumental in setting up a meeting between John and McDaniels, who agreed to showcase FUBU on the Video Music Box, a show that is watched by nearly everyone in FUBU's target market. Chapter 4. Doing your homework can help you succeed. You review if you wish to pass the test. You start asking questions, get the lay of the land, and figure out which topics to avoid if you want your first meeting with a partner's parents to go well. In business, it's the same. If you want to impress an investor, close a transaction, or obtain a job, 
you must first learn about the individuals on the opposite side of the table. To put it another way, preparation is what brings the bacon home, isn't it self-evident. Sure, but it's the type of obvious sounding concept that quickly fades from memory. According to a recent career builder poll, just 64% of job applicants bother to research a firm before applying for a position. Then there's the author's personal investment experience. Many people like watching Shark Tank, an American reality TV show in which entrepreneurs present their business ideas to a team of five experienced investors. Isn't that one of the primary draws? It's fascinating to watch these investors pick apart a shoddy company proposal. These parts are amusing, but they aren't the focus of the show. Entrepreneurs like John, who have been a shark for 11 seasons, would like to hear about grain breaking new ideas and get in early. Solid pitches, on the other hand, are uncommon. Most participants just wing it, whether it's due to laziness or hubris. Randy Goldberg and David Heath stood out because of this. They started Bombas, a sock company with a philanthropic bent. Together, Bombas donates another pair of socks to needy shelters for every pair sold. John was immediately enamored with the concept, but he needed to know if it worked first. Randy and David were ready to improve it to him. They sought out an old industry insider after forming Bombas. They learned almost all there is to know about knitting socks for him. They watched every episode of Shark Tank before going on the program and prepared responses to every question posed by a shark during the show's history. They perked John's interest and he proposed a $200,000 investment in exchange for 5% ownership in Bombas. The firm is now prospering and John's decision proved to be a wise one. So what is the takeaway here? It's simple. The effort you put in will always be repaid. Chapter 5. To succeed, you must collaborate with others. You've heard the cliches, it's a dog-eat-dog world out there, and the good men always coming last. Whatever you're doing, hold your head down and watch out for yourself, otherwise no one will. Correct? This has a grain of truth to it. It's a difficult business, and you're surrounded by individuals seeking to shift their own power. And there's a lot more to it. Consider driving. Texting while driving is dangerous since it causes you to lose sight of what's going on around you. It's the same when you're trying to advance in your career. When you're exclusively focused on yourself, you're more likely to miss potential risks. Companies like FUBU usually distribute their clothing to stores in cartons with many sizes of each item. However, not every store is the same. A major store with tens of thousands of consumers may sell a popular clothing brand in all sizes. A small mom and pop shop, only with a few dozen clients on the other hand, will find it difficult to reproduce. The bigger sizes may sell well, while the smaller sizes continue to stay on the shelf, or vice versa, depending on the population they serve. When this happens, retailers request that labels such as FUBU shatter the box. This entails removing the in-demand sizes from the standardized packaging and delivering them to their business. Brands, on the other hand, despise it. It's a logistical nightmare. They'll have to figure out how to sell whatever is left in the unopened boxes. When FUBU was confronted with this issue, it was an excellent position. It was making millions, and John reasoned that they could avoid the bother. People may always go to a larger shop to get FUBU clothing. What he hadn't considered was how these businesses would react to FUBU's move. They started advertising fire deals on FUBU's goods because they had the stock they couldn't move. That's not good news for a popular brand. People wondered why your product is on the clearance rack as soon as they see it. Soon, your hard-won reputation will be jeopardized and consumers will turn to competitors. It was a priceless lesson. What is John's conclusion? Make a solid deal. Don't grow so arrogant that you put your offers at a disadvantage. It might come back to haunt you. Chapter 6. It's not only your tongue that communicates, your entire body does as well. Each episode of Shark Tanks begins in the same manner. Before starting her presentation, a competitor approaches a set and walks over to the shareholders. On the broadcast, she appears to start speaking right away. There's a little difference in the studio though. Before adjusting their equipment for the pitch, 
the camera team films the stroll. This generally only takes a few minutes though. Investors and the candidate are expected to keep silent throughout this period. This is a pivotal point in the show for sharks. What is the reason behind this? During this time, they have the opportunity to assess the individual in front of them. While waiting, some contestants fidget a lot, emphasizing their lack of confidence. Others assume a powerful posture and stare the sharks down, a technique meant to convey confidence but really reveals arrogance. A sardonic smile, on the other hand, recognizes the discomfort and helps diffuse the situation. These first impressions are really important. Take it from a UCLA psychologist, Albert Morabian, who is a renowned specialist in nonverbal communication. Words account for only 7% of what we convey, according to his research. Tone, on the other hand, accounts for 38%, while facial emotions and body language accounts for 55%. Meanwhile, Inc. Magazine studied 2,000 business discussions and found that not a single transaction was struck following meetings in which one or both parties were present. The good news is that your body language is under your control. Take a few suggestions from John's experience to help you better yours. First and foremost, make eye contact. You know you should look at the person you're speaking to, but what about when you're speaking to a group? Many people make the mistake of instinctively locking eyes with the most important person in the room, alienating everyone else in the room. What is the solution? While speaking, make sure to glance around at everyone in the room. Then there's the matter of facial expressions. Self-awareness is the key here. Recording yourself reading from two Twitter feed accounts is one method to get a grasp on what your face is saying. Select an account from someone who irritates you and a timeline from someone you respect. Examine each tape for subtle and not so subtle variations and see if you can conceal your actual sentiments the second time around. And now you have it, a few pointers to help you gain influence and move your power. Book Review Powership How to Master Your Three Prongs of Influence to Close Any Deal and Achieve Any Outcome by Damon John Book Review. The most successful brands sell lifestyles rather than just a variety of items. You're communicating a narrative about yourself and what you stand for when you buy what they create. In the same manner, personal branding works. People notice when you stand up for something and that gives you power. That's where your power shift will begin. It's all about doing your homework, working with rather than against others. Even people who are often missed and watching your body language from here on out. Examine the results of your excellent acts. Karma is a genuine thing. That's the lesson John learned when his refusal to assist tiny stores selling FUBU's clothing came back to bite him. The bottom line is that it's a good idea to give as much as you take. Are you still not convinced? So, give this a go. Consider all the times you've let down your guard, done someone a favor, or met a negotiation partner halfway. Did such decisions benefit or hurt you in the long run? They probably brought their own rewards, whether they solidified your reputation or provided you with a beneficial link. That's the extra point to keep in mind in the next time you're at a meeting or dealing with a new partner. That's right on this book summary, Power Shift by Damon John. If you want the summary, click the link below to download this. We at Best Book Biz have done over 1,000 summaries in video, written, and audio format. So subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and also bestbookbits.com. I've also compiled the best of the book summaries, 500 book summaries, in one massive PDF. So again, click the link below to check this out, to download all 500 book summaries. Thanks for watching and listening. Have yourself an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye now.